Good morning. My name's Tracy Thomas. I'm the worship and music minister here at Fairmount Christian Church, and we're so glad that you've uh, joined us here online for our worship this morning. Re and I would like for you to join with us as we begin with a couple of hymns this morning. Good morning, and uh, I want to echo Tracy and say welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us here on this Sunday morning as we are gathered uh, in communities around the world today, uh, and we're gathered here to worship. Uh, the name of Jesus is indeed wonderful, and I know in your house, wherever you are worshiping today, uh, you are reflecting on the wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus. This is a special time in our uh, services where we, we always take a moment to uh, read scripture and pray together. And I want to read for you a passage today from the book of Colossians. If you have your Bible or have your phone there with you and you'd like to turn to the book of Colossians. Um, here at Fairmount on Wednesday mornings for over, to, over 15 years, we have had a, a Wednesday morning Bible study. This week I conducted that Bible study online. You're welcome to join us on Wednesday mornings as we uh, have a Bible study. We're going through the book of Colossians right now. And this past um, Wednesday, we got to uh, a, a passage in the, in the book of Colossians that just touched my heart greatly here in this strange times in which we are living, this, this crisis in which we are all uh, uh, walking through together. And this passage just blessed me. It reminded me of what my life should be like every day, but especially 
especially in times of turmoil. And I want to read that passage for you from from Colossians chapter 3. Paul writes these words, and and listen to what he reminds each and every one of us uh, to be mindful of daily. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Three times in three verses, Paul reminds us of the absolute importance of gratitude, of thankfulness. And I know that in the midst of all of the things that we're living through right now, sometimes it's hard to focus on the the good things, the things for which we have to be thankful But here on Sunday morning, as we gather together, we're going to bow our heads right now, and we're going to express our thanksgiving to God. I'm going to pray in just a moment, um, um, uh, but I'm going to ask you where you are to just take a few moments of my silence and just offer up your gratitude for whatever you're grateful for today. might just be that you're able to get out of bed today. might be that your, your computer actually is working right now. I don't know what you're grateful for today, but whatever it is, turn in that gratitude and offer that up. And after a few moments, I'll I'll close our prayer. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father in heaven, we do indeed have so much to be grateful for. Lord, our world is in turmoil. Our country and our communities are are at a high level of anxiety and worry. And yet, Lord, we know that we can bow our heads even for just a moment and express our gratitude for the blessings that we do have. And Lord, those blessings are different for each and every one of us. Those those experiences that we're going through, the things that we, we have, the things we have access to, each of us, Lord, are grateful for different things. But we all understand all of those things are a gift from you. And so today, in the quietness of this worship time, we each bow our heads and say thank you. We say thank you for the life that we have. Thank you for the salvation that we have. Thank you for the wonderful name of Jesus that we have. Thank you for the eternal life that we have through him. Each and every day, Lord, help us, encourage us, challenge us to to take time in every day and express our gratitude. You have blessed us with much. May we always be thankful. May we always be grateful. I lift this up in the name of Jesus. Amen. We come now to that important time where we observe uh, communion, the Lord's Supper. We hope that you have your emblems ready, whatever form of bread and drink that you're going to be using for communion. And as we prepare our hearts for that time, let's be singing together, I Need Thee Every Hour.
We have now come to the communion time that we gather around this table together. And we have many thoughts going on at this time. You know, so many of us that we've had many things going on these past few days that we've never experienced before. We've had so much uncertainty and anxiety around us. There have been many conversations among the elders of this church and also their wives concerning what we're facing. But each and every one of us have always followed up with scripture that we could go to for comfort and assurance and answers that we know he will give. Max Licato, in this past week, had in one of his devotions, we talk about shortages of supplies in the grocery stores and medical supplies and answers to the big question, why? One thing of which we will never run short of, we will never run short of God's love. He's with us now, and he always will be. He's strengthening, he's, is strengthening us and is watching over us. God promises to provide for us. And when it feels like things are falling apart, God promises to be there for us. Psalms 46 reads, He is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. We need him today, and we'll need him forever. Matthew 11 has Come unto me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. We need to turn to him. I was talking to a friend recently about the conditions of today, and I remembered something that I had heard, and I brought it, it brought to mind this little saying. He brings us to our knees sometimes so that we will look up to him. We are talking about turning to him. Also goes with the hymn that we sing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Jesus looked full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of the glory and grace. At this table, we think of the sacrifice that was done for us. We look in that face and see the love for each of us. Here in this building behind me is the stained glass of our Savior. And his hands are stretched forward and his eyes are fixed out on us. I like to look at and gaze upon that during this time. Because as I partake of the emblems, I can truly and humbly remember the great love that was bestowed on all of us. The sacrifice of our Father made for us, you and me. Let us bow in a word of prayer. Father, we do come to you now. We come to you bowing down because we know of your great love. You loved us so much, so many years ago, thinking about each and every one of us, that you sacrificed your son so that we may be forgiven. Father, let us not today forget about the, that great love. Father, we're all seeing so many things that make us sad, but yet we can be happy that one day we're going to be with you because of your great love. As we gather at this table and partake of these emblems, let us remember the sacrifices that you made for each and every one of us. Amen. Matthew 26 records, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body.
Then Matthew records, then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's bow for a prayer. Father, we have just spent time gathering around your table, a table that was prepared with the emblems of your great love. Father, as we partook of those emblems, we pray that each person's heart was open to you and turning to you. Father, we ask that you continue to be with each one of us. Guide us, direct us, and lead us on. It's in thy name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Anaseri, and I'm one of the ministers on staff here at Fairmount. Uh, this is the time of our service where we uh, take up our tithes and offerings. And as I was, as I was reflecting about our congregation uh, this past week, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for your incredible generosity that you've continued to show uh, during these times where we have not been able to meet together personally. And as I was thinking about you, uh, the verse that came to my mind was 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, which says, But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I would encourage you to continue to excel in giving as we continue the work uh, of God's kingdom uh, here at Fairmount uh, and our community and all across the world. Will you please pray with me now before uh, our offering? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time we have to be together. Lord, thank you for how you provide for us. Thank you, Lord, for how uh, we are able to help grow your kingdom through our giving. And Lord, I thank you so much for uh, all the work that's taking place here in our community, in this congregation, all around the world for you. And Lord, I ask that you would bless all of the gifts, the tithes, the offerings I'd have received, Lord, and that they'd be used for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, we've been doing this panel as part of our worship series the last few weeks uh, here at Fairmount. And each week we've been talking about a different uh, part of the worship service uh, and focusing on that, what the Bible says about it, why we do those things. So we've talked about praise and music. We've talked about communion. Uh, we've talked about preaching last week. Uh, today we're going to talk about response. And so uh, today I have my friends Judy Allard and Fred McGee, and they're going to talk a little bit with me uh, about response in worship. And, and really we're going to talk about two different things, two main things about response. And I want to start with what happens at the end of a service, which is the invitation. Uh, we, we have an invitation at the end of every service. And uh, now, both of you uh, have been Christians for a long time. Not, I'm not saying you're old or anything, but you've been Christians for a long time. And so uh, each week we have this invitation time. So being a Christian, a mature Christian, leaders in the church, those type of things, what, what are you thinking about how do you respond personally during that invitation time? Thank you, Chris. Um, one of the things that always goes through my mind is what a privilege it is that we can be invited every single time um, that Christ continues to invite us. Um, a lot of times we have the privilege, Randy and I have the privilege of also attending for the preparation for baptism in the back. So I will say that I survey the situation to see if someone could be coming down front because I know that that will include a responsibility for me. But the response to the invitation is always one that is special to me, um, generally because it is personal. Christ makes a personal invitation. And whatever hymn that Tracy has chosen, um, 
always fits that need. And I just, you know, I thank Tracy for what you do, Tracy, and I, you know, and I thank our church for knowing that that invitation is so important. Well, you're all right. I've been a Christian for many years, and I am an old man. But during the, um, the invitation time, um, I don't want to say my mind wanders. A lot of times we're singing, so if the hymn is good, I'm you know, into that. But a lot of times my mind kind of does um, reflect back to me when I was a little fellow. And I stepped out into that aisle and walked down it um, over at Walnut Grove Baptist Church. And I can remember my heart was pounding, nervous, excitement, but I was getting ready to do something really big. And to answer your question, I guess I pray a lot that if it's on someone's mind and heart to step into that aisle on that particular sun Sunday, to get out there and walk it. I've seen y'all do it, not every Sunday, but I've seen y'all do it. And I remember Dr. Skaggs, um, as a small boy, as we're singing the verses, I'm like, hurry up, let's roll, I'm hungry, let's get home. Um, but as I got older, he would, you go through verses, and every verse was sung. And often he would get towards the end, you know, third verse of a song, and he would turn and stop the music and offer one more invite. We'll sing the last verse, if it's on your heart, to come down the aisle. And I just remember that. And a lot of times folks would walk down it. But always praying, um, the object of this exercise is to get people baptized and become followers of Christ. So I'm in prayerful consideration a lot of times that that'll happen, if it's the Lord's will. Excellent. And that's, that's what I'm doing a lot of times when I'm leading the invitation, just praying for people, that whoever comes, and, and glad we have people ready to receive them. And, and baptize them and, and pray or whatever needs to, needs to happen. Um, yeah, it's a special time in our service. Uh, another special time, one I just, we talked about earlier, I just talked about offering, prayed for offering, that type of thing. And we have so many different ways we can give now. I mean, we, we give, give through the mail, give online, tech, text, all these different ways, besides just on Sunday morning, uh, putting your tithe or offering, offering into the offering plate. So do you think that all these different ways of giving and not having to, to give in person, has, how has that affected that time of response and worship, that time of giving? Has it affected it in any way, or how has it affected it for you? I know for myself, I like having different ways to give because maybe I haven't always brought what I needed to bring with me on Sunday morning, or maybe something has been placed on my heart uh, by what has gone on in the service or with the sermon or in the bulletin when I'm reading about something that all of a sudden God places on my heart an urge to support that. I love that we have an opportunity to give in other ways. I also really like that we also give that opportunity right then, right there. I'm with her. I agree that um, what Judy said, I think it's great that we have different ways to give. Um, my bride gives online, you know, every pay payroll dedu deduction, every, um, every week it comes out, every other week. But me personally, I got to write that check. As most of y'all that, that know me, uh, I, I'm not a real good person, and I have to force myself in many cases to, to be a joyful giver. And I don't always do that. I, I sit there and write that check, and I'm looking at that stack of bills, and you know, how much can I write here, and you know, what, what should I do? I'm trying to get better at that, but for me personally, I gotta write it. I gotta sit down and write it out. Years ago, um, Larry Hakey was, was, was teaching our Sunday school class, and he, he brought up the point, you know, we follow a king. Jesus Christ is our king, and if, if we're followers of Christ, we're part of his kingdom. And if he's the king and we're part of his kingdom, anything we got, he gave us. But I still struggle with giving back what he already has, what's already his. So I think it's awesome that people that can't attend on Sunday can give in different ways throughout the month. That's awesome. Church needs that. But um, I think we need to be reflecting on what we're doing when we are giving, however that might be. Thank you, thank you both. Um, one last question, because responding in worship, or responding to worship, doesn't always happen right here in this room at that time. 
uh, sometimes, a lot of times it happens later in the week. So can you think of a time where Sunday morning worship has impacted your behavior later on that week, a decision you made, an action you took, a conversation you had, something like that where you, you, it, what you did here on Sunday morning in worshiping God affected that week? Absolutely. One thing for me is I find that it's not always what happens during the sermon, but it could be something that happened during the music, it could be hearing someone else pray. It can be the communion meditation. Any of those things are definitely ways that are impactful to me. I also find that I love looking around to also see who can worship with us that day because sometimes I will know some of the backstory and I will know that it was a true sacrifice for them to be here. And I think about that, and that impacts me too, that... Um, our presence is needed, that we do need to gather together. And that particular piece for me comes back to what does Christ want me to do this week? And one of the things that I love that, that you all do in your sermon outlines is you always have something at the end, and sometimes it's an actual action to be taken or, or something to remind us to take what we learn and move forward with that for the week. And uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate the time that you all take for that. But yes, the things that happen during the Sunday morning worship experience definitely impact us. And it can um, obviously be on a Sunday morning or other things can affect us during the week. Um, I'm the sales guy. I can't follow orders. I can't do what you ask, answer your question. I answer my, my own way. But something that came to mind when you asked is um, was actually at a funeral service years ago. The preachers here do an awesome job. Every Sunday we're blessed. But I think it was a funeral service and it might have been the first time our friend Mike Langley, I ever heard him sp speak. Um, the gentleman that had passed, Tom Royer, had brought him to Sunday school. His name was Charlie Washington, I believe was the gentleman's name. He had become a recent believer, baptized, and died shortly after that. And what got my attention of that sermon was Mike Langley came up to read scripture and he introduced the author of the scripture as the valedictorian of the human race. And he was talking about King Solomon and I thought that was so cool. And the verse that he read is, 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 doesn't sound like a really um, sweet verse, a cheerful verse, but it really affected me and it, it affected how I look at things um, from that moment on in a, in a real manner and the verse was, for it is better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of every man. The living should take this to heart. And got me into Ecclesiastes, reading and reading and reading about this, you know, King Solomon, which we've all read over the years. And then about that time, I fo finally followed the advice that was given by three great men in my life. Um, my daddy, who I wish happy birthday to last Wednesday turned 88 um, Billy Graham and that other great Christian man Ken Powell who for years had suggested read Proverbs coincidentally 31 chapters in Proverbs coincidentally 31 days in most months I say that tongue-in-cheek I don't believe it's coincidence but you can read a chapter every day and not go to book every month the wisdom obey the Lord, follow the Lord. And when Solomon was following that advice, his own advice, he was the heaviest hitter on the planet. Israel was at its zenith. We know the rest of the story. He didn't always follow his advice and bad things happened. But the particular verse that I read, it really impacted me, not just because of what's going on today, but what's been going on for five, 6,000 years. We're a mist. We're here for a little bit, then we're gone. And we're not doing anyone any favors if we're not sharing the good news, the joy that we have with other folks because we all have the same destiny. We don't all have the same destination. And I think it's important that we share that with as many folks as we can while we can. Well, excellent. I, I appreciate both of you being here and your thoughts and being here to worship together. So thank you very much. 
Well, I uh, want to iterate, uh, reiterate uh, Chris and uh, say thank you to our panel for uh, blessing us uh, today and, uh, tell, and giving us some of their reflections and thoughts. And uh, I've, um, um, it's, it's always a, such a great exercise to, to spend a little time uh, thinking about why we do what we do. It is easy to fall in the habit of just doing what you always do. And I think uh, our... Uh, Last uh, several weeks of talking about worship um, has allowed us to think more about what we do. Again, let me say welcome to you. It's good to have you worshiping with us this morning. Um, we are all here at Fairmount. We are all praying for you um, each and every day, uh, our elders and our staff, uh, all of our uh, Bible study leaders and teachers. We're praying for you. We're praying for the people of this church, the people of this community, and of course, our nation and our world. Uh, we Each and every time I have the opportunity to talk with you, I remind you, if you have any needs whatsoever, please reach out to us here at Fairmount. Our our uh, website is fairmountchristian.org, and you can find contact information there. Uh, and if we can help you with your needs during this time, uh, we would be honored to do so. But you need to let us know, and uh, we would love to help you. Uh, Chris shared a little bit ago, we have spent the last week, or, excuse me, the last month talking about worship. We began four weeks ago uh, with the definition of worship. Uh, a reminder for all of us that worship is a daily endeavor. In fact, <clears throat> our definition of worship is that worship is a daily expression of our love for God. Worship is not just something we do on Sunday only. It's my hope that you worship every day. It's my hope that you take time out of your day to intentionally spend time with God that you take time intentionally each day expressing your love to Him through prayer, uh, through music, through expressions of gratitude, through all throughout your day, every day of the week. Worship is an everyday thing. But we also recognize that with the topic of worship, that Sunday morning worship is paramount to what, to what Fairmount does as a church and really what most churches do. Regardless of what church we call home, uh, Fairmount, our church, the church to which I have the privilege of, of serving, has, has taken here in the last month the main elements of worship, and we've been discussing them from a biblical perspective, uh, both in our panel discussions and from the pulpit. We've talked about praise and worship. We've talked about communion, the Lord's Supper. We've talked about preaching. And today we want to talk about response. One thing is clear, regardless of the venue of worship, whether you're worshiping in private, you know, on your own, or whether you're worshiping in public, whether you're in your home, or whether you're in a church sanctuary or an auditorium, in worship, we enter into the presence of God in a powerful way. Now, I think we all know we are always in the presence of God because God is always in our presence. But in the intentional act of worship, the presence of God is made real to us like in few, if any, other ways. Moses. Moses is in the presence of God. He's there at the burning bush there in the wilderness. It is such a profound setting that God tells him, take your shoes off, Moses. Later, Moses asks to see God, and though God will not let Moses see him fully, um, he does give Moses a glimpse, and even that glimpse, being in the presence of God, is such a powerful thing that Moses' face, his very face, is transformed. It's changed, it's transformed so much that they have to put a veil over his face uh, so it won't, it won't frighten and it won't, uh, it won't blind people, it won't overwhelm the Israelites. Paul is in the presence of God, Jesus himself on the road to Damascus, and not only is he blinded, his life is changed forever. In fact, history is changed forever. Being in the presence of God is a powerful thing. 
Several years ago in the, in the mid-90s, I had the opportunity to travel from upstate New York to Atlanta, Georgia for a Promise Keepers rally. They were having a pro- Promise Keepers was a prominent uh, uh, men's gathering of the late 80s and, and uh, into the mid-90s. And uh, men from all over the you know, uh, regions would come together for a time of in- encouragement and worship. And they had a pastor's conference in the Georgia Dome in February uh, one year. And I, I will just, I will never forget worshiping with over 50,000 men in the Georgia Dome. I, I thought listening and singing and, and being in the midst of 50,000 men singing songs of faith, I just thought we were just going to go ahead and levitate right into heaven. It was amazing. But I also go down the hall here at our church on Sunday mornings and I stop outside the room where our children are worshiping. And they're worshiping God with all their hearts. And my heart soars. The presence of God is a powerful thing. Worship is such a powerful thing that when we are, we, when we are in the presence of God, we can't help but respond. Worship should always lead to a response on our part. And I want us to talk for a few moments this morning about that response. Now, I think we should look at that response, and I think our our panel really kind of pointed us, uh, kind of um, didn't know it, but they were pointing exactly what I want to share with you this morning, and that is our response is multidirectional. In fact, I believe it, it's, it's in three directions. Our response is measured vertically, our response is measured internally, and our response is measured horizontally. I want to tell you what I mean by that. First and foremost, the response should be vertical. Now, this is the most important. Worship changes our relationship with God. Whether you are in worship privately or whether you're worshiping with the church family, whether you're at home on your couch or whether you're worshiping in a stadium full of people, worship affects our relationship with God. In praise, in singing, through the songs that we sing, we recognize the different aspects of who God is. We honor Him in those songs. A little while ago, we sang one of my, one of my favorites, you know, His name is wonderful. What a great way to, to reflect on the vertical relationship we have with God. In communion, we spend this quiet time eating a meal with God. In the first century, the most intimate thing that, that the community did was to eat together, share a meal together. And I think that's true in our day today. Maybe you're even experiencing more opportunities to eat with your family during this crisis that we're going through. We get, when we worship together, we, we get to enjoy the intimate meal time with each other and with God. In our giving, we take our income and we give it to Him. No strings attached. We give it to Him because we love Him. We give it to Him because uh, we get to freely express our, our gratitude and love for Him. And then in preaching, we're drawn into His Word. We're drawn into His presence. We're drawn into His very will. Worship powerfully affects our relationship with God. If you've ever been tempted to say... Well, I didn't get anything out of worship today. Well, then you missed the point. If you didn't get anything out of worship, then you didn't come into the presence of God. Worship isn't about you anyway. It's about Him. Entirely about Him. So we must first and foremost focus on the vertical. Worship motivates us to improve our relationship with him. In Acts chapter 3, Peter has just, he's just healed a man. And this attracts a crowd, a man who was a a beggar every day. Now they see him, a lame beggar, not able to walk. Now they see him walking around and it attracts a crowd. Peter is never going to waste the opportunity. When a crowd is gathered, Peter's going to talk. And he launches into a gospel message there. And he comes toward the end of that message and he says in in chapter 3 of Acts, verse 19, he says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. People had just been, they had just been privy to the intervention of God. They experienced his presence in an amazing way. And they were now, Peter says, they are now motivated to improve their relationship with God. 
that vertical improvement might involve repentance. It might involve confession of Him as our Lord. It might involve baptism into Him. It might involve humble prayer. That vertical improvement might involve life change. It might involve a refocus in life. It might involve a change, an improvement in that relationship. As the old saying goes, if you're feeling far away from God, ask yourself, who moved? I guarantee you, he did not. Worship draws us closer to him. We can't help but respond. We can't help but grow closer to him. In worship, the response should be vertical and the response should be inner. Worship changes us personally. Now, I truly believe that if we're focused on Him in worship, if our vertical relationship is growing stronger and stronger, then we will be transformed as well. Now, our, our Thursday morning men's group, of course, we can't meet uh, together right now, uh, but uh, as, as we're meeting now online, um, we're going through the book of Nehemiah. And that, that's a, the book of Nehemiah is just an incredible book about obeying the will of God. And it really shows about what obedience means in the midst of real life situations. Uh, Nehemiah addresses uh, obedience to God in highly stressful day-to-day life, much like today. In chapter 8, all of the people of Jerusalem come together for a time of worship. The crumbled walls of the city have been repaired, they've been rebuilt, which they understand could not have been done without God's intervention, and they come to worship, and in that worship they hear the reading of the law, the the priests open up the books of the law, and they begin to read them to the people. And this this is what the interaction Nehemiah has with them in chapter 8, verse 9. It says, Nehemiah the governor... Ezra the priest and teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep for all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Oh, that's one of our favorite verses in the Bible, isn't it? The joy of the Lord is your strength. They came together for worship, and they were greatly impacted. They felt shame for their past behavior, but Nehemiah said that that conviction should be converted into joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Worship should result in joy. Worship should result in peace. Worship should result in contentment. Worship should result in assurance. Being in the presence of God has to change us. Or maybe we weren't in the presence of God. I know the cares of life weigh us down. And those cares don't go away merely because we spend an hour in worship together. But worship, drawing closer to God, gives us the tools for coping with anything that this world has to offer. All over the world today, people are gathering in their homes to worship. And why is that? Well, a global crisis is driving us from our church buildings into our homes. But we still gather to worship. Why? Because we recognize we need this. We need to do this together. We need the connection with God and the betterment of ourselves. In worship, we can't help but respond. We can't help but be personally and inwardly transformed. Worship leads to a powerful multi-level response. The response is vertical, the response is inner, and the response should also be horizontal. Worship changes the way we treat others. We cannot leave worship the same. We are moved closer to God, we are shaped and molded by Him, then we step from worship to the world around us, serving, helping, teaching, encouraging, 
loving those who are so desperately in need of it. The, the woman at the well in John chapter 4 came into the presence of God. She meets Jesus Christ, God in human flesh. She sits down next to him there at that well, and her life is changed forever. Her vertical was transformed. She met God. Her inner was transformed. She felt shame and then experienced the transformation into joy. And then her horizontal was transformed. The very town that had shunned her, leaving her to fetch water in the middle of the day when everyone else came early in the morning, they became her personal mission field. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Huh. She knew. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. She went to tell others the greatest news she had ever experienced. I have found the Messiah. Worship motivates us to leave the time of worship and go to others. We, we, we can't keep the vertical and the inner transformation to ourselves. We have to tell others about our relationship with Jesus. We have to serve others in loving and sacrificial ways. We have to seek ways to help the hurting. We have to befriend the friendless. One of those emails that I receive each and every week is an email from Breakpoint. It's an organization that, that, that uh, looks at culture through the eyes of Scripture, through the biblical, uh, world, a biblical worldview, the lens of the Bible. And John, John Stone Street is one of those authors. And in this, one of the articles, that I get, they come out daily, but one of the ones that came out earlier this week um, included a story of a global pandemic of the past. In the third century, the plague of Cyprian, how would you like to have a plague named after you? The plague of Cyprian uh, swept many parts of Europe. Dionysius, the bishop of Alexandria, wrote that the Romans were throwing the sick into the streets and leaving them there to die, except for the Christians. The Christians would not just simply leave them there. As one author wrote, Christians, quote, ran into the plague. Now, I'm not encouraging anyone today to ignore the wise directions of the CDC and all of the preventions that we have put into place. Of course, we, wanna, we, wanna, we want to do the things we're supposed to do. But I also know that when Christians emerge from worship, altered vertically and inwardly, they will run into the plague. They will help whoever needs help. They will serve whoever needs serving. I don't tell you this story to, to, to pat anybody, to pat myself or anybody else on the back. It just, it just dawned on me that this is how, if you uh, are a follower of Christ, this is just how, how, how this works. But the other night, uh, it was around 10 o'clock at night, I received a phone call at home, and one of our members of our church had their spouse had fallen and couldn't get up. And she called me, and she said, could you help me come over and, and help, uh, help him up? Uh, he's not hurt. He just, I just can't get him up and get him into, into bed. And I said, of course. So I, I hopped in the car and uh, headed over, and I, I called my friend Chris Sanisari, and I said, Chris, uh, what you doing, buddy? And uh, he said, nothing. I said, well, come on, help me out. we got to go help a friend. So uh, we hopped in the car. And as I'm driving down 360, it just all of a sudden dawned on me, oh, we're, we're in the middle of this coronavirus. What, what does that mean about what we're getting ready to do? Well, anyway, we plowed on. And we went into the home, and we helped the, the gentleman uh, uh, up off the, off the ground, and uh, we, we helped him get into bed. And I, remember, and I said, as we were helping him onto the bed, he was finally settled, and he was always good, I remember just kind of laughing and saying, I sure hope you don't have the coronavirus. And then he looked at me, serious as could be, and he says, I hope you don't have the coronavirus. And we laughed, and then we got out of there. You know, I mean, we, you know. But, but here, the, here's why I tell you that. It, it never dawned on us to do anything but serve. Because that's what Christ has called us to do. And you would have done the same. Because worship has transformed you. The culmination of our worship 
is our response to his presence in our lives. How will you respond today? I would encourage you to ask yourself those challenging questions today. Did I draw closer to God today? What in me did he shape and mold? How am I motivated to go serve others? True worship will always lead to a response. In our invitation time today, in our response time today, we just want to encourage you, wherever you are, to just spend a moment maybe reflecting on those questions, reflecting on whatever the Holy Spirit is encouraging you to reflect on today. And if there's a decision you need to make, do not hesitate. Do not wait to make that decision. Maybe it's something inward that needs to change. Maybe it's something about your vertical relationship with God. Maybe it's something about your service to others that needs to change. Offer that up to Him in prayer today during this invitation time. If you need to make a decision and need to talk to somebody here at Fairmount, again, get on our website, fairmountchristian.org. We have lots of different ways to get in touch with us through that. And uh, I would love to uh, talk with you, meet with you on the phone, whatever it takes uh, to help you in your walk with Christ today. Whatever decision you need to make, we want to encourage you to make it today. Let's pray together. God, I'm just so grateful for the the very invention of worship, that it truly touches every part of our lives, our spiritual relationship with you, the people who we are inside, and then our relationships with others. Worship transforms every single one of those things, and I'm so grateful for this gift whether we are gathered in a room with, with 50,000 people or whether we're sitting alone at home, Lord, we can worship. And worship will always transform us. I'm so grateful for the gift of worship. May we never take it for granted. And may we always do in worship what you would have us do as we draw closer to you each day. Thank you for this precious time together this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for worshiping with us today. We will uh, more than likely uh, be uh, right here uh, next week at the same time. Uh, I hope uh, you have today a blessed day in the Lord. Good day.